What is genocide? The word genocide comes from two words. The first being yenos, which is the Greek word meaning race or ethnic group. And the word side, which is the Latin word meaning to kill. The word was coined by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish lawyer of Jewish descent, who had an interest in the crime of mass killings and its relevance to international law. His interest in the subject came about following the brutal massacres of Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire in 1915. In 1948, he presented a draft resolution for a genocide convention treaty, which America put before the UN and it was formally adopted. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations. Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide? I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians and uh, after the Armenians, Hitler took action. We have all heard of the Jewish Holocaust. However, it wasn't the first genocide in the 20th century. One of the first genocides in the 20th century was the genocide of the Greeks, Armenians and Assyrians, which happened in the period of 1914 to 1923 in the Ottoman Empire in what we know today as Turkey. Greek genocide is the term used by modern genocide scholars to describe the violent campaign instigated against the Greek subjects of Ottoman Turkey during 1914 to 1923 by two consecutive governments of the former Ottoman Empire, the Committee for Union and Progress, better known as the Young Turks, and the nationalist Kemalists led by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. The campaign included massacres, forced deportations including death marches, summary expulsions, arbitrary executions and destruction of Christian Orthodox cultural, historical and religious monuments. According to various sources, approximately one million Greeks perished in total during 1914 to 1923. The English-speaking media widely reported the Greek genocide here and overseas. There were many methods used by the Turks to exterminate the Ottoman Greeks. One of them was deporting them to the interior of Turkey without food, water or shelter. On the 21st of August, 1916, the New York Times reported the following. Turks deporting Greeks. Civilian concentration camp victims attacked and despoiled. The Turkish authorities, acting on instructions from Constantinople, where all power is still in the hands of the Germans, are rounding up civilians in a considerable number of villages and sending them off in batches to concentration camps in the interior. The following account by Lieutenant Murray, commander of the USS Overton, details the Kavak massacre and the deportations of Greeks in the northeastern region of Turkey in 1921. A copy of this eyewitness testimony is housed in the United States National Archives. 2,500 girls taken from various villages were deported. They had been so badly dealt with they could hardly walk. In all, there were five parties of deportees. The first and second parties, numbering 900, came from Samsun. But of these, only 200 arrived safely at Sivas, clothes torn, some entirely naked. They had been robbed even of the fillings in their teeth. After the first and second parties arrived, the others came on in comparatively good condition. There was considerable deportation done between Malata and Kaldi. These were conducted orderly and had Diyarbakir as destination. Mr. Fuller says he met about 3,000 women and children under Turkish guards. Babies tied on the backs of women and girls. One girl had her hands tied and was being led by rope held by an older woman. She had lost her mind. This was July 6. Massacres of Greeks were also widely reported during the period. On the 5th of December 1918, the newspaper, The Barrier Miner of Broken Hill in New South Wales, wrote the following. Greeks and Armenians, Turkish massacres, figures total hundreds of thousands. Since the war started to the end of 1917, the Turks deported many Greeks and Armenians, of which 700,000 Armenians and 200,000 Greeks had been massacred, 
while 200,000 Greeks who had been mobilised in the Turkish army had been put to death or had died of their sufferings. Genocide survivor Savas Kirizoglu from Tsiprail in Turkey recounts what he remembers when Topal Osman, a chief instigator of Christian massacres, entered his village. It started from Trebizond, and whichever Greek village they could find, they massacred and destroyed, and they came as far as our district in Erba. Are you recording all this? You are. They arrived in Erba, which was a large town. There they slaughtered the ones they captured, and those that managed to flee did so during the night. Then they came looking for us on the mountains, where we were living, up in the mountains in our villages. There, in one of the five, five or six Greek villages, which were all in close proximity, people had arrived from there and scattered themselves amongst the other villages. And they came to this one village called Hatsibeli, a large village which was amongst ours. And they had heard that it was there that a lot of crime, theft and so on was occurring. And he went there one night, he circled the village so they couldn't leave. Some did, however, leave from the sides of the village. He threw them into the wells. He killed them and then threw them in the wells. There was a river beside the village and they went and stabbed them alive with knives. And they threw them in the river. And the mothers were carrying their children in their arms as they were leaving. And as the water line in the river was getting lower and lower, and the child was in the arms, the child started shouting and screaming. And the child approached its mother, who was lying there dead, and began sucking her breast. And then our people went to the village, after the Turks had left. And whoever was still alive, they took them to our village, and of those people, some had neck injuries, others had knife wounds, and they died years later due to their injuries. Boycotting of Greek businesses was also a method used to bring about the destruction of Greek communities in the Ottoman Empire. Reverend Arthur C. Ryan, missionary of the American Board of Commissions for Foreign Missions, said the following regarding the boycotting. During 1914, I saw the working of the official boycott against the Greeks in Thrace and along the lateral of the Sea of Marmara. Not only were Muslims forbidden to buy from these Greeks, but they were encouraged to take their goods and then walk off without paying for it. Muslims were forbidden to sell anything to the Greeks. Many Greek merchants were financially ruined by this boycott. Other methods used were torturing of women and being given the alternative of changing their faith to Islam or being put to death. On the 3rd of August 1915, the Argus newspaper of Melbourne reported. Ghastly stories, Greek women tortured. Several Greeks at Marsivan were compelled to dig a trench as a grave before they were shot. Greek women were given the alternatives of embracing the Islam religion or death. Their lives were spared, but they were left to the mercy of the soldiers and compelled to accompany the troops on a long march. Some fell exhausted and were abandoned with their babies. In the lengthening days of March, the Germans extended their attacks to the west bank of the Meuse and to a hill with the sinister name of Mort Um, Dead Man. The Greek genocide came about during a period in which the Ottoman Empire was crumbling. Making matters worse, the Turks sided with the Germans in the First World War, in which it lost. The elite in the Ottoman Empire during that period were the Greeks and Armenians, who controlled the economy and trade, and its citizens held the most important positions in society. The Committee of Union and Progress, otherwise known as the Young Turks, was a nationalist movement which assumed power in 1913 and began singling out the Christian minorities. One of their mottos was Turkey for the Turks. On the 31st of January, 1917, Mehmet Talar Pasha, the Turkish Minister of the Interior and one of the leaders of the Young Turks, said the following. I see the time has come for Turkey to have it out with the Greeks, the way it had it out with the Armenians in 1915. At the outbreak of World War I, the Young Turks began singling out all the able-bodied Greek men, who were put into labour battalions to perform slave labour. This was one method of exterminating the men and preventing births. Survivors Kostas Tsaniklidis from Kumash Madem 
and Maria Papadopoulos Brenner describe the conditions in the Labour battalions. All the male population from the ages of 14 to 60 years of age, they deported them to various regions of Turkey, as far as Sevastia and the Ameni, where a lot of our people went. For instance, my cousin went there. With the conscription, they conscripted all the male population from the ages of 14 to 60. They put them in the Amelet Daburu, the so-called work battalions, in which my father also died. They would gather up all the men, the Greeks, the Christians in general, and they would send them off to build roads for the Turkish army to pass through snow. My father died there, and not only my father, but many men. They lived in cold, hunger and so on, and they perished. They died in the interior. In the work battalions, they were sent to do the most difficult jobs. They would put them in tents that had holes in them, without mattresses or blankets. They were merely concentration camps. And if by chance somebody escaped, they tortured him until he died, in front of everyone else, so that nobody else would try to escape. That place became their resting ground. Where did they bury them? Where did they put them? The bones? That was the burial ground of the refugees, as they say. When I talk about it, my soul hurts. They fed them a soup called alao churpa soup a German type of soup. It contained beans and chickpeas, which were rotten and impossible to chew, and they were made to do work from one night right through to the next. After the First World War, those responsible for the massacre of innocent Christians were tried by authorities and court-martialed, most of them receiving death sentences. The three of the most notable members of the Young Turk regime were sentenced to death for the roles they played in organising the massacres. On the 13th of July, 1919, the New York Times reported, Turkey condemns its war leaders. Court Martial gives death sentence to Enver Pasha, Talat Bey and Jamal Pasha. All three made escapes. It is the climax of a long series of prosecutions undertaken by the officials of the new regime to clear the skirts of the Turkish people from blame for joining in the war and for the Armenian, Greek and Syrian atrocities and deportations. Following the First World War, Mustafa Kemal, a Turkish general who had helped lead his nation to victory in the Anzac campaign, against Australia and New Zealand troops in 1915, was asked to disarm the Turkish army in the east of the country. Instead of disarming them, he reorganised them with the aim of ousting Greece, who in May of 1919 was sent to the east of Turkey by a mandate of the British to occupy Smyrna, known today as Izmir. The Greeks were sent to Smyrna mainly because it was inhabited by a large number of Greeks and also to protect them from further massacre by the Turks. During the next two years, Mustafa Kemal and his nationalists committed numerous outrages, particularly in the eastern region. In September of 1922, Kemal and his forces defeated the Greek army, causing them to flee Smyrna, leaving the city's Christian population at the mercy of the victorious Turkish nationalists. On the 13th of September in 1922, the Turks set fire to the Greek, Armenian and foreign quarters of the city. The Turkish quarter was spared. On the 18th of September, 1922, the Sydney Morning Herald said, Smyrna ablaze, stories of massacre. Except for the squalid Turkish quarter, Smyrna has ceased to exist. The banks, commercial and residential houses along the quays and the foreign quarter have been reduced to ashes. The fire swept an area of two square miles. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, in his memoirs titled The Aftermath, stated the following regarding the Smyrna fire. Mustafa Kemal's army celebrated their triumph by the burning of Smyrna to ashes and by a vast massacre of its Christian population. 
Miss Minnie Mills, the director of the American College of Girls, testified as follows regarding the fire which ravaged Smyrna. Soon after lunch, fire broke out very near the school and spread rapidly. I saw with my own eyes a Turkish officer enter a house with small tins of petroleum and benzene, and in a few minutes the house was in flames. Our teachers and girls saw the Turks in regular soldiers' uniforms, and in several cases of officers' uniforms, using long sticks with rags at the end of which were dipped in a can of liquid and carried out into houses which were soon burning. There was no one in the streets at the time but bands of Turkish soldiers. While the fire started just across the street from our school throughout the Armenian quarter, every third or fifth house was set on fire. Chairman of the Executive Board of the American Women's Hospitals and President of the Medical Women's International Association, Dr. Esther Paul Lovejoy, was in Geneva attending a conference when the Smithana fire started and was dispatched immediately by the American Women's Hospital. In her book titled Certain Samaritans, she tells of what she saw in Smyrna after the fire started. The greatest crime against humanity with which I am personally familiar was committed on the Smyrna Railroad Pier during the last week of September 1922 and consisted in the separation by military force of the members of all Christian families. At every gate during the daylight hours, this atrocity was conducted systematically. As family after family passed those gates, the father of perhaps 42 years of age, carrying a sick child or other burden, or a young son, and sometimes both father and son would be seized. This was the climax of the whole terrible experience for every family. In a frenzy of grief, the mother and children would cling to this father and son, weeping, begging and praying for mercy, but there was no mercy. With the butts of their guns, the Turkish soldiers would beat these men backward into the prison groups and drove the women toward the ships, pushing them with their guns, striking them with straps and canes, and urging them forward like a herd of animals, with the expression, hey there, hey there, which means be gone, be gone. Famous American author and journalist Ernest Hemingway was a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star at the time and witnessed the burning of Smyrna. In his short piece titled On the Key at Smyrna, he describes the suffering of the panic-stricken Christian refugees who were awaiting to be rescued from the Turks. And the strange thing was how they screamed every night at midnight. I do not know why they screamed at that time. We were in the harbour and they were all on the pier and at midnight they started screaming. We used to turn the searchlight on them to quiet them. That always did the trick. We'd run the searchlight up and down over them two or three times and they stopped it. Various officials were present in Turkey during the genocide and their accounts proved valuable in shedding light on the injustice of the Greeks. Arthur L. Frothingham, in his book titled Handbook of War Facts and Peace Problems, published by the National Security League, New York, in 1919, wrote the following. In Turkey, there was a large and flourishing Greek population, influential and rich. The Turks feared that the European powers might decide to allow Greece to annex the parts of Macedonia and Thrace that had a majority of Greeks, nearly a million in Thrace alone, and also perhaps the islands and rich southern shores of Asia Minor, peopled by Greeks from time immemorial. The New Turks, in 1913, decided that these Greeks must be moved, impoverished, killed or put out of the way. The purely Germanic scheme of wholesale deportation, combined with robbery and destruction of all property, was adopted. The work began in Asia Minor, nearly a year before the war. In October of 2011, independent Senator Nick Xenophon called on the Australian government to recognise the Greek, Armenian and Assyrian genocides. I rise to speak tonight on an issue that is sensitive for many reasons. From 1915 to 1923, the Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian people were the victims of one of the first modern genocides. The exact figures are not known, but it is estimated that over 3.5 million people died as a result of deliberate, systematic actions by the Ottoman Empire. The Armenian, Greek and Assyrian people endured forced marches into the desert with little or no food or water and imprisonment in so-called relocation camps, which were effectively concentration camps. Ottoman troops also massacred countless victims in vicious attacks on cities and local villages, which included mass drownings, burnings and poisonings. The Republic of Turkey, which succeeded the Ottoman Empire, does not recognise these events as genocide. Australia has yet to recognise the Greek genocide. However, there have been a number of MPs and senators who have risen in Parliament, calling for an official recognition. 
Currently, the genocide still remains unrecognised by Australia.